Now, I'm going to start by just describing in simple terms what we're doing. Some of you may have heard this before. Um, and then go on to discuss some of the issues as to how it relates to the evolving city and the way that the city works. Actually, very specifically, the West End, not the City of London. When I refer to the city, I mean the West End of the city rather than the city city. Now, as some of you will know, the Royal Academy bought the old Museum of Mankind building, originally designed as the headquarters of the University of London in 2001. Um, now I've realised it. How do I get... Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I mean, this is an absurd photograph, I realise, because you can't see it like that, because the street is quite narrow, and actually it makes it look sunny and bright, whereas actually it was rather dark, I always felt it was rather like a building in East Berlin, partly because it's a Victorian classical building, and frankly, absolutely no money had been spent on it, uh, pretty much from 1868, when it opened. Uh, by 2001, it had already been a topic of much debate, particularly internally in the Royal Academy, as to how it should be used. Philip Doughton... Uh, when he was president in the 1990s, wanted it to be used as a centre for architecture, combining the resources of the Royal Academy for Architecture, we represent a lot of the leading architects, with the drawings collections of the RIBA. People may have forgotten, but there was a feeling at the RIBA in the 1990s that the drawings collection would have to move from uh, Portman Square, which eventually did, but it did not come to our building, it went to the V&A where it now is. And there was an idea then that it would also ally itself with the Architecture Foundation, which was extremely active then, run by Ricky Burdett. But as you will all know, this didn't happen because the RABA drawings collection uh, went off to the V&A. The next president, Philip King, uh, the sculptor became president in 1999 and he wanted it to be used as a creative space, uh, possibly including artist studios. This didn't happen because a very ambitious scheme drawn up by Michael and Patty Hopkins, which involved a glass roof over the backyard, became disproportionately expensive and did not attract funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund. Uh, my, my view is the timing was wrong because, as many of you will know, in the early stages of the Heritage Lottery Fund, the London institutions were very well prepared and put in bids immediately in 1994 and attracted a disproportionate amount of the funding. And then, for very good reasons, rightly, I think, the Heritage Lottery Fund shifted its emphasis to projects outside London. And the Royal Academy, which took time to get its application going, and I think, in retrospect, probably asked for much too much money, did not get it, and that scheme collapsed. When I started as Secretary and Chief Executive in 2007, the building was essentially being used as temporary hire space, unreconstructed, just as a cash cow for the Academy from rental income, with part of it about to be converted into office space by Dunnett Johnson. In 2008, we held a limited competition which focused just on the building in Burlington Gardens on its own. I knew that previous schemes, including a master plan drawn up by uh, Colin St. John Wilson, Sandy Wilson, the architect of the British Library, had focused on the issue as to how to connect the two buildings and that this was far from straightforward. I encouraged all the competitors to focus only on the issue as to how to make best use of the old University of London building in Burlington Gardens itself. Now, as you might have guessed from the picture on the screen, <coughs> uh, the competition was won by David Chipperfield, who had been elected an RA on the 11th of December 2007. You may detect some of this is trying to get my thoughts in order uh, before the opening, which is in May. It's hard to remember that in 2008, the Norris Museum in Berlin had not yet opened, nor Turner Contemporary, uh, nor Hepworth Wakefield. 
He won the competition as a result of the sense of intellectual clarity and authority with which he approached the brief. He had gone back to the original ground plan as designed by James Pennethorne. Next slide. Uh, um, <laughs> this is nearly completely unreadable. But, um, in fact, interestingly, David had been a competitor in a previous, the original competition in 1996, so he knew the building well. And you can see its basic formulation, which is, had a big grand Victorian 900 seat lecture theatre on the west side, and then it had a huge, great, very grand, equally grand double height library on the east side, and then it had what I think are called examination rooms, or laboratory rooms, in the back. And then an absolutely, absurdly disproportionate amount of the building is given up to a monumental central staircase. So that uh, it's a big building, but it has oddly little publicly usable space. So David had realised, or I suspect also in conjunction with Julian Harrop, the conservation architect, with whom he had worked on the Niles Museum in Berlin, they, they had realised that the original design of the building had this large 900-seat day lecture theatre on its east side, and they proposed to reinstate the lecture theatre in a modern way. Since one of the requirements of the brief was to provide a good quality lecture theatre, and since, so far as I'm aware, None of us had thought of having a lecture theatre as the principal public feature of the building above ground. He won the competition. And to be honest, this is the one and only feature of the project which has remained pretty much as he originally proposed it in May 2008. Now, as I've said, the project is due to open on May the 20th this year. The facade has already been cleaned. Next slide, although this is actually not the facade as is, which still has boardings in front of it. It'll be dominated by a new 257-seat le uh, daily public lecture theatre. If we could have the next slide. Um, the, actually, no, that looks pretty much as it's going to be. Uh, at the back, there'll be a new set of exhibition galleries, which will allow us to do more contemporary exhibitions. On the west side uh, will be wonderful space to show our own collection. Um, I mean, we, we, we have a collection which is, doesn't pretend to be the equal of the um, tape, but it is a very strong collection of British art, which is not normally uh, publicly accessible. The one feature which postdates the original competition is that after about a year, David's project ar architect, Andrew Phillips, said that we needed to work out how best to connect the two buildings. He, and I think David as well, not me, went to talk to then, the then keeper of the Royal Academy of Schools, Maurice Cockrell, as to whether or not it might be possible to consider the construction of a public route through the middle of the Royal Academy of Schools and thereby connecting the two buildings axially from front door to front door. Let's have the next slide. Uh, um, basically, here's Burlington House, here are the wonderful uh, Sydney Smith exhibition galleries here, as was described. The schools are under the exhibition galleries. Lots of people don't know they're there. Um, this is Burlington Gardens, so the original plan was just to do that. But you can see it's obvious. <laughs> it's better if we can connect the two buildings. But because the schools runs across the site, we had assumed wrongly, and the architects had assumed, that you couldn't go through the schools. But uh, what David solved, I mean, it's obvious in retrospect, is that you have a central route connecting front door to front door. And there's a bridge across the backyard. Um, we'll keep that on for a minute. Um, no, we can go on to the next slide, sorry, which shows the bridge across the backyard, which um, I wish the project was more nearly complete. <laughs> um, it, it's getting there, but not quite as fast as I would like. Now, obviously, the theme today is not what the building will do for the Royal Academy, which was our original focus, but what it will do for the surrounding neighbourhood and for London as a whole. Halfway through the project, 
We, and I particularly, got involved in the discussions and debates surrounding the development of Cork Street. There was, as you may remember, a heated debate around the supposed eviction of the old established small-scale contemporary art galleries and the presumption that they would be replaced by big fashion brands, as has already happened to a considerable extent in Dover Street and Albemarle Street. My own view of this issue is that the culture of, the, of cities can and should evolve. In fact, Cork Street was really no longer the centre of the contemporary art market, as it had been in the 1950s, because during the 1990s, contemporary art tended to be much larger in scale, and so the gallery owners looked for cheaper industrial space in East London, and it's only recently that they've begun to return to the West End again to big gallery spaces, as in Hauser & Wirt in Savile Row, or Gagosin in Crovener Hill. It's at least possible that the new development in Court Street will attract a cluster of new international galleries, which will recreate the sense of this part of London as being a rich art neighbourhood, somewhere to visit at the weekend, equivalent to Chelsea in New York, or the 798 uh, district in Beijing. Oddly enough, one of the things I'm very anxious about is to persuade the art galleries to be open at the weekends. That they tend to think in terms of <coughs> private clients, and I, I understand they like not to be there at weekends, but to be honest, it seems to me for it to work as a neighbourhood, one of the first and obvious things to do is to get the art galleries to open up. I don't guarantee that this will happen. What I do think is significant and will definitely happen is that there will be a flagship cultural institution right in the heart of the commercial West End. What, what I think policymakers often don't pay enough attention to is how competitive city culture is. What makes an affluent American or French mer merchant banker want to be based in London rather than in Paris, New York, Geneva or Frankfurt? The answer is not just the tax system or the schools, but broadly considered the culture, which includes the theatres and the art galleries. What makes a French or Spanish or Japanese or now increasingly Chinese tourist book a visit to London rather than Rome, Madrid or Paris? The answer again is not just the quality of the hotels and the exchange rate, but the quality, again broadly considered, of what's described as the cultural offering, museums, art galleries and temporary exhibition. Uh, the next slide is just um, the, the series of wallpaper city guides which focus on new buildings, new architecture, and new design. I think it's a shift from the traditional model of what guidebooks focused on. So what is it that makes the economy of the West End work? I think it's not just the presence of the luxury brands as one walks down Bond Street. Uh, next is just a picture of uh, Louis Vuitton. <laughs> I'm reminded of... Um, I mean, I mean what, I, what I realise being there is the incredible significance of Bond, Bond Street as a kind of engine of the luxury goods economy. And whatever you think of the luxury goods economy, it's very important to London. So those kind of little luxury brands, they turn over a huge amount of money and frankly, they attract hugely wealthy people to that part of London. Uh, it's not just the big hotels, including the Ritz, Claridge's and the Connaught, and put a picture in on the Connaught. I, I personally think that what makes Mayfair interesting and significant as an international tourist destination, and we should not underestimate how important that is to the national economy, is precisely the odd and distinctive mixture in Mayfair of art, tailoring, old buildings, flagship stores, back streets and auction houses. It's this mix which is why people come to London, why people like living here, and it's important. And I hope that our new building, when it opens in May, will make a big contribution to the cultural element of this mix. Thank you.